Well, this morning, if you have a Bible, I invite you to turn to Isaiah. Prophecy of Isaiah in the Old Testament. I'm not sure which page that's on. If you have a Bible, I encourage you to, to find it. It's also going to be on the screen behind me here. Isaiah chapter 55. We'll read the chapter, but we'll be focusing really just on the first three verses. We read, Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend your money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good, and you will delight in the richest affair. Give ear and come to me, listen, that you may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. See, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a ruler and commander of the peoples. Surely you will summon nations you know not, and nations you do not know will come running to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel. For he has endowed you with splendor. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them and to our God for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I send it. You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush will grow the juniper, and instead of briars, the myrtle will grow. This will be for the Lord's renown, for an everlasting sign that will endure forever. In the afternoons here at Covenant, we've been doing a study on the canons of Dort, and just today we're switching things up a little bit. And I'm going to read just one little article from um, this confession. It's something that we hold to as a Reformed church, something we believe and confess together. Usually we confess it in unison, but I'll just read it for us this morning. And it's talking about how the Bible and God calls the church to proclaim his gospel. Moreover, it is the promise of the gospel that whoever believes in Christ crucified shall not perish but have eternal life. This promise, together with the command to repent and believe, ought to be announced and declared without differentiation or discrimination to all nations and people to whom God, in his good pleasure, sends the gospel. Why don't we ask... God, for his blessing as we uh, study this text together. Almighty Lord and holy, awesome creator, and you are our redeemer and our savior, our rock, and we take refuge in you. And Lord, as we're going to spend some moments looking at your word, we pray that as we just read here in Isaiah, that just as you send the rain and the snow down from heaven onto the earth, and they don't return to you without watering the earth and bringing forth a harvest. We pray, Lord, that as you send out your word this morning, that it would not return to you empty, but that you would send it forth to accomplish what you desire. And this is all for the praise and the glory of your holy name. So help us by your Holy Spirit, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, kids, what's your favorite meal? What is your favorite meal or feast of the year? Maybe it's Thanksgiving. Maybe it's Christmas. You can close your eyes for a minute and just imagine what's on the table. You close your eyes and, and you imagine you know, the roast turkey the mashed potatoes, however you like to 
to make them, maybe with paprika and butter, salt, pepper, whatever. The fresh, warm bread, the broccoli and Caesar salads, the ham, the stuffing, whatever it is. A great feast. A feast, maybe. You think of a feast like you've never had before. But then on the other hand, I don't know if there's any Harry Potter fans here, but J.K. Rowling in her famous series describes one event where the main characters get invited to a feast. It's this massive party, but it's not a birthday party. It's called a death day party. And it's put on by a bunch of ghosts. Now remember, this is fiction. I know, sorry to burst your bubble, but this is fiction. This is not reality. But Rowling does an incredible job of describing this feast. At this party, it's a party where the whole ambiance is just gloomy and dark and smelly. And spread out on the tables, there's this large fish rotting away. Cakes, burnt charcoal black. Meat pies crawling with maggots, cheese covered in mold, and in pride of place on a silver platter, this big cake in the shape of a tombstone decorated with, uh, with uh, black tar. You almost wonder whether she was reading Proverbs 9 when she thought of that. How the fools call out, come to the feast, and God says, it's a feast of death. Well, if you're here this morning... And you're not a Christian, whether you're visiting, whether maybe you're watching online, whether you've been coming to church, maybe for years, every single one of us outside of Jesus Christ, all we have is death. All we have is this terrible food that this world offers us, the sinful world offers us that cannot satisfy. But in the passage that we just read, in contrast, the text shouts an invitation. It says, come, come, eat, drink, and be satisfied. And God says to you this morning, come away from that feast of death. Believe in my son, and I will prepare for you an infinitely better feast than any Thanksgiving or Christmas feast you have ever had. And so the first thing that we pause to notice here is the invitation. And we have to ask, who's the one doing the inviting? I've already alluded to it. But imagine, with me, you're at home, and there's a knock on the door, or the doorbell rings. What's your first thought? Probably, oh, it's another Amazon package. What did I order today? We order so many packages, we forget what we, we order. Well, so you, you go to the door. It's not Amazon. It's a letter. It's a fancy letter. You pick it up, and it's got this gold lace and this fancy writing, and you open it up, and it's an invitation to the most exquisite restaurant in all of Canada. And apart from whatever other thoughts might be buzzing through your mind, what's your big question? You look down the hall or across the street or whatever, and who's this from? It doesn't have a name. It's addressed to you, but it doesn't say who it's from. So, of course, with an invitation, there must be one Inviting, pretty, pretty simple, right? An invitation implies someone inviting. In this passage, what we have in the scriptures, what you're hearing today is the living God inviting you to a feast, inviting you to find salvation in his son, Jesus Christ. And that's what we're going to talk about today. The true and the living God, the eternal one, the one who created you, and he's saying, come. He's saying, come to this feast and live. Why will, you, why will you die? Come. Come and live. Well, why, why might you be thirsty? You maybe ask me. You know, the, the text says, come. All you who are thirsty, come to the waters. You say, well, why might I be thirsty? And I say, because you're living in a wilderness. And you say, is this guy crazy? He's been living here all of July. It's rained almost every single day. Well, I'm not talking, of course, about a physical wilderness. Toronto's beautiful right now. It's lush. 
No, I'm talking about a spiritual wilderness. If you're not in Christ, I'm talking about your heart. That everybody who is outside of Jesus Christ is living in a spiritual wilderness, walking through this life, and everything that you try will leave you dry. Family, work, friends, your music, your partying, your cars, your homes, whatever it is, there's nothing in this world that will satisfy your soul. Haven't you cried out yourself? Don't you know this cry in your heart? What's the point of life? God says to you, come. You're estranged from him. Your heart's evil. Your heart's corrupt. If you're not in Jesus, you're living in rebellion against God. You can deny it, but someday the sugar coating is going to come off. One day the rose-colored glasses aren't going to work for you anymore. But God speaks to you in the wilderness, in the wilderness of your sinful, estranged heart. And he says, come. Come to a free feast. Buy bread, buy wine, buy milk, without money. When was the last time you walked into Walmart or Longo's and the manager comes up to you and says, hey, here's a bag of milk and a loaf of bread and a bottle of wine. I think we probably feel quite the opposite. Every time we go to the store, it seems like prices have gone up. But here, God is offering this free feast. How can you and I come and buy food and drink without money? The answer is very simple. Someone's paid your bill. The Bible says that someone is Jesus Christ. He's paid your tab. And God says to you, leave your wicked ways. Turn to me. I'll have mercy on you. Because of your sins, you deserve wrath. But I'll have mercy on you. And I'll pardon you for your sins for free if you believe in Jesus. So why, God asks in our text, why will you spend your money for food that's not actually food? Why do you work for things that will not satisfy you? There's this incredible parable in, in Scripture of this guy who goes out and cuts down a tree. You can imagine he grabs his axe, or today he grabs his chainsaw, goes out into the forest, finds the perfect tree, chops it down. You know what he does? He uses part of it to build a fire and cook his food. It's a cold night, so he uses another part of it to build the fire bigger and keep himself warm. Then you know what he does with the other part of it? He makes an idol and falls down and worships it. And the Bible says, don't you see? Don't you see how foolish that is? You're worshiping essentially ashes, this rotten food of the death day party, these things of this earth that cannot ever satisfy you. Why will you spend your money on things that cannot feed your soul? You work for earthly dust and ashes that will never satisfy. My friend, show me. Show me, what have you worked for that's going to last forever? What have you spent your money on that actually gives you true and lasting joy? You and I come into this world naked and we leave this world naked and God says, if you sin against me just one time, you've broken all the law. And we'll stand in front of God and he will judge us. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death. So why? Why spend your money on things that do not feed you? Work for things that will not satisfy you. God says, no, listen, listen, listen to me. Eat what is good. I'll give you what's good. You'll delight in the richest of, of fare. You'll eat a rich feast. God says, listen, listen to me. Listen to my call. Listen to my invitation. You know, it's an incredible thing. What we've done, modern man with our technology, in South Africa, there's this project called Meerkat. It's the largest radio telescope on Earth. It's a series of satellites that are exploring about 100 galaxies, examining more fully and closely a million different stars. And this great scientific research program, you want to know what it's called? It's called Breakthrough Listen. That's what it's called, Breakthrough Listen. You know what they're doing? They're listening out into the far beyond. Is there any, any noise, any sound out there, any extraterrestrial life, any word from beyond? God says, that is so foolish. God says, 
I am speaking to you in my word right here. Give ear to me. Come, listen to me, that you may live. We don't need to send our antennas and probes far beyond into space. We have God's word. God speaks to you. God speaks to me. He says, listen, I am offering you life. And he does that through his son, Jesus Christ, who shed his blood on the cross so that you and I could live. Your life without Jesus is nothing but death. Why do you stay in your sins? Turn to Jesus. Turn and live. Come to him. You'll find rest for your soul. God's calling to you today to listen. Listen to me, says God. Come and you'll live. Turn to me. Look by faith to Jesus. And the Christians around you, if you're not a Christian here, the Christians sitting around you are saying, yes and amen to that. I have tasted of the Lord's goodness. I have tasted of God's salvation, and it has fully satisfied me. And the Christians around you are praying that others would come and know the peace and the joy that is offered and found only in Jesus. So stop listening for extraterrestrial life. Stop looking to your horoscope. Stop trusting your pension plan. Stop living for today. Look instead to that man on the cross, Jesus Christ who bled and died to give you life. Come freely. Don't come with your spiritual credit card. It's got nothing on it, nothing that you can offer to God. You're corrupt. You're sinful on your own. You have nothing in your spiritual bank account that you can offer to God. But he says, come. Come and receive this salvation freely. And then he says, I will make an everlasting covenant with you. My faithful love promised to David. Who's David? The Bible says that the greater David is Jesus Christ, the descendant of the physical David, Jesus, God's own son. And so God offers you an everlasting covenant of peace and of love. Think about that. The God who is who was, who always will be, the Alpha and the Omega, the God without beginning, without end. If he offers to you his love, that will be an everlasting love. The loves of this world, they grow cold, they die. How many people around us don't have broken marriages, broken families, friends who've stabbed you in the back? God says, come to me. I will make with you an everlasting covenant of peace and of love. But we got to say as well, if you reject God's invitation, you'll stay in your sins and you'll die under the wrath and the judgment of God. If you don't bow your knee to him, the Bible says there's a lake of fire, an eternal torment and punishment for all of eternity. Because you see, there's two feasts. There's two feasts. And on that great day when Jesus comes back, he will judge the living and the dead. Every single person who's lived and every single person who's rejected him and not believed in him will be judged. And the Bible paints this metaphorical picture for us that when Jesus comes back as great judge, every person will ultimately bow the knee but will be destroyed by the sword of Christ. And then we read, the angels call to the birds of the air, come, gather together for the supper of God so that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals, and the mighty, of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, great and small. That's the first supper. It's a symbolic picture, and yet a symbol of what will be a reality. But we're talking about this second feast, this other feast, the marriage supper of the Lamb, where every single person who has put their faith in Christ, who's accepted this invitation, will feast with God in his presence forever. We're looking at Isaiah 55, but earlier in Isaiah's prophecy, there's this incredible text in chapter 25, where the prophet writes, and pointing forward to what he's going to say here, on this mountain the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats, the finest of wines, On this mountain, 
He will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. And of course, think about a feast. If I invite you to a feast, am I going to eat with you? The one who invites you to a banquet or a feast, the host, is going to eat with you. But as he's spread out this great banquet of salvation, what's he eating? In the language of Isaiah, he's eating death. He is swallowing up death. That's pointing to Christ on the cross. Christ, when he took your sins and he nailed your sinful heart to the cross to die there. And then, as he experienced the wilderness that we experienced, and he cried out, I thirst. And then as, as your maker bowed his head and breathed his last, and the cold, clammy shroud of death washed over the Savior. And he was laid in that cold, dark tomb. And as the stone was rolled in front of it, the jaws of death clamped shut. Until, until that third day when Jesus burst through the bonds of death, when he shattered death and left death to, to lie cold and dead alone in that tomb. And Jesus went forward. He's living today. He's in heaven today. And he calls to you, every single one of us, come and live. If you believe in me, you share in my resurrection. So that even if you die, even if you were to die today, you, are, you will be raised with Christ. Because if you have faith in him, he has already given you the promise of life. What does Jesus himself say right after he fed the 5,000 or more than 5,000 in John 6? What does he tell his audience? He says, truly I tell you, you're looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. A lot of the people who ate the bread that he miraculously supplied, they came and they just wanted to see more, more miracles. And Jesus says, I'm not here just to do miracles. He says, no, do not work for the food that spoils, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. Doesn't that sound like Isaiah? And then the people say, well, what must we do? What, what must we do to do the works of God? What does Jesus answer? He says, the work of God is this. Believe in me. God says, come, without money, without price, come. Salvation is free. There is nothing you can ever possibly add to it. No good work ever but come, receive it freely. Believe in Christ, and you'll have life. And then what does Jesus himself cry out? He says, God has given us the true bread from heaven. Or he says, sorry, rather, I am the bread from heaven. He says, I am the bread of life, and whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. And then what does he say just a short while later? He goes to the Jewish Feast of Booths. For the Jews, that was the biggest feast. It lasted seven days. It celebrated God's miraculous provision. It celebrated the completion of harvest when there's an abundance of food. What does Jesus do at that great feast? He stands up and he cries out in a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within him. Jesus Christ is the bread of life. Jesus Christ gives you the water of life. There is nowhere else in all the universe that you can possibly find life except for in Jesus Christ. He is the true and the greater David. And he is the one who offers himself for you and for me so that we will one day 
if we believe in him, if we are saved through him, we will feast with him in paradise. We will experience the joys of God's presence forever. That's what the end of the Bible talks about. The end of the Bible, this incredible passage in Revelation 22, where we read, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, clear as crystal. Not like the Humber River, dirty and gross. No, clear, perfect, beautiful, crystal clear. Waters of living, of of life, waters of life, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. In the paradise of God, there will be an abundance of food for God's people. That symbolizes life. And that is only to be found in Jesus Christ. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city. His servants will serve Him. They will see His face and His name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun. Why? For the Lord God will give them light. And they will reign forever and ever. So what's it going to be? Are you going to stay, if you're not a Christian, are you going to stay with the death day feast? Are you going to reject God's invitation? Are you going to keep lying to yourself that you can fill the God-shaped hole in the wilderness of your soul? It'll never work. Pleasures of this world will never satisfy you. Will never fill your heart. And there is nothing in all the world that you can possibly do to earn your way to heaven. The only way is to come and by faith to lay hold of the bread of life. By faith, believing Jesus has died for me and then to drink of those living waters that he offers. That is the only way to take that free gift As Revelation also says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star, the spirit and the bride. Say, come, and let the one who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty come, and let the one who wishes to take the free gift of the water of life come. Come to Jesus Christ. Come to the Savior. If any of you are here and you're not a Christian and if you have felt in any way that dryness in your soul, then answer the call of God. Hear his invitation for you and live. And know the Christians around you are saying, hallelujah, this is true. Hallelujah, my soul has drunk from these living waters. Hallelujah, I know I am heading to the paradise of God because Jesus is my savior. The Christians around you are saying, I have life in Jesus Christ. I know there's nothing I can do ever to earn my salvation. But I have taken of that bread of life. I have drunk from the living water. And I have life. Life eternal with God. And know that as a church, we're praying for you. That our desire, as Jesus' desire was, is that our Father's house would be full. That sinners from far and wide, from all nations and tribes and tongues, would come, would bow the knee before Jesus. That people would stream to this great feast that we're all looking forward to. There are two feasts, and God today invites you to come to the feast of life. Let's pray together. Lord, we first pray... For anyone here today who has not yet believed in Jesus, whether whether a visitor, somebody new, we're so happy they're here, whether somebody who's maybe been sitting here for a long time, whether maybe some of our covenant youth who need to hear this, Lord, we pray that their cry would be, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. Father, I have sinned against you. Have mercy on me, a sinner. That they would bow their knee, that they would not pay their money 
or work for those things in this world that will never satisfy, that they will come to you, that they will look to Jesus and that they will find life in him. And Father, as a church, our prayer today is that you will lead out many in joy, lead many forth in peace, that the mountains and the hills would burst into song before, before you, that the trees of the field would clap their hands, that instead of the thorn bushes and the briars of the curse of this world, that they would be trees, mighty trees in the house of God. Lord, not for our glory, not so that our names would be lifted up, no, Lord, but for your renown. Oh, Lord, we pray, glorify your holy name and do that work by your Holy Spirit that we can never do. Bring lost sinners to Christ, we pray, so that your name would be magnified, honored. You would be glorified. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.